So we are going to kick off for our 12 o'clock session with a session called More Than a Business, Immigrant Entrepreneurship in Rhode Island. Um, and this session will be um, hosted by Anna Gonzalez of The Mosaic, the Public's Radio's podcast on Im immigration. And I'm going to actually let her kick it off and introduce everyone. Well, hi, Amy. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. This is a lot of people. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed, a little nervous maybe, but you know, we're all gonna have a great time. Um, so first I wanna say Conroy is not here yet. I did say, I've been trying to contact him, but I think it's because he's currently working on it, like finishing up doing something for his food truck. So he lives a very busy life, but he will be here. Um, but that being said, um, I wondering if I could share the screen cause I have a couple little, Cool, great. My name is Ana Gonzalez and I'm the host of Mosaic, which is a podcast now in its second season from the Publix Radio, which is, I hope you all know, it's your local NPR station. It's not BUR and it's not WGBH. It's the one that's here in Providence, 89.3. Um, and Mosaic is, here the next screen, Mosaic is a podcast about immigration and identity in America. Um, and what we do with this podcast, and I'll explain it and then I'll introduce everybody a little bit more. Um, but what we do with Mosaic, if you haven't heard it, is um, we tell personal stories of immigration. So we want to broaden the conversation of immigration from just being about politics, policies, what's happening right now, border wall, crazy divisive language that dehumanizes people and their experiences and bring it to just who is immigrating to Rhode Island and Southeast Massachusetts? Why are they leaving their home countries? What opportunities are they looking for? Do they want to be here? Is this just a step in the road for them? Uh, do, was this always their dream? And just getting to know these different human experiences through specific people. And so two of those specific people are here with us today. And I know there are a lot of immigrants in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, but uh, these two, gentlemen have agreed to be part of episodes of Mosaic, which is kind of an intimate process where I ask a bunch of questions about your entire life and like the things that kind of the worst parts of your life and the best parts of your life. And you got to think back a lot. So um, with me today, I have Conroy Uttar, who immigrated from Jamaica when he was in his 20s and now is the owner and operator of Ja Patty Food Truck. And then also Charlie Chin, who uh, immigrated from China, Hong Kong when he was about four years old and is the owner operator of Asia Grill, both their locations. They just opened up a new fantastic location in Garden City in Cranston. And also with me is Jennifer Nazareno, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and she's a professor, uh, assistant professor at Brown University, both in public health, but also uh, with the Nelson Center and does a lot with entrepreneurship and immigrant entrepreneurship. And so she's gonna help give some context to kind of how does immigration affect the economy? Uh, small business, what is, it, what is it like to be a small business owner and an immigrant in America? Um, and so, Charlie, do you mind being first? Okay, let's go Charlie. So that's Conroy, we'll get to him later. Here is Charlie. And um, that's Charlie with his daughter, Chanel. Um, and so our last episode of Mosaic that aired this past weekend. Um, the, Charlie's episode aired this past weekend and it's all about kind of the, it was a complicated uh, episode. It was about Asia Grill and how he came to start being in the restaurant business, but it was also about kind of the history of Chinese immigration and uh, assimilation for lack of a better word into uh, Rhode Island society. And going back to, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s, there's a history of uh, Chinatowns that w existed in Providence and then were demolished by the city through eminent domain and a lot of discriminatory housing practices. And I'm gonna play a clip right now. Uh, I'm sharing my audio, so if it doesn't work, let me know, but um, the uh, discriminatory employment practices that Charlie experienced. And so you're gonna be hearing from him and you're gonna be hearing from Professor John Eng Wong, who is a uh, professor emeritus at Brown University, who speaks a lot to the history of Chinese American uh, culture. So here's a clip from the latest episode of Mosaic. 
you look at the corporate structure of the company that you're working for and nobody looks like you, chances are you're not going to get there. You reach a certain limit. Uh, you know, without feeling resentful or, 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 or defensive or anything like that, you just say, hey, I did my very best. And that's what you're hoping for. You're hoping for your kids and your grandkids to have a better opportunity than you, but you've got to learn to accept your fate in the time that you were born in. So Len retires early and teams up with his brother, Charlie's uncle, to invest in a business that they know will work, a family-run Chinese-American restaurant. They pressure Charlie to join them. My career choices back in those days was this way, restaurant or laundry. That's one choice. Or go to college and be a professional. Not an actor, not a poet, you know, doctor, lawyer, whatever. Okay? I'm the dumb one. Went to college and then go into the restaurant business. If you were a Chinese American, you weren't necessarily welcomed. People of my generation, in many cases, even though they had college educations, ended up in the restaurant business. And I think, in part, this is an expression of employment exclusion in that generation. So that's a clip. Um, and, and Len, if you're wondering, is Charlie's father. So Chanel's grandfather, who was the first one to come uh, and immigrate to the United States. And so at this point, I want to ask Charlie, could, where are you? Could you unmute yourself? Are you there? The mute button. You, oh, wait, hold on. I can't hear you, Charlie. I see you. The mute button is like at the top of your screen or bottom. I don't know, but it's there. Charlie, I can unmute you. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. Hey, yeah. Charlie, can how you? are you? Yeah. Hi, how are you? I'm good. So first of all, I want to thank you for being here. It's really cool that you're here and that you also agreed to do this long interview process and make an episode with me. So that's really cool. Um, I also, so I want to start off just by asking you, you know, what was it like to kind of relive a lot of your memories and thoughts and experiences through this episode of Mosaic? And also, what it was like to share that with Chanel, your daughter, which is kind of interesting. I don't get to interview many intergenerational families from Mosaic. Yes. Well, you know, it's very interesting because I see the, um, you know, what my father and I went through, then I see what I'm going through with my daughter. And I think the natural regression that is happening is very good. My father was a, a child of the Depression came here when he was 13 years old in the uh, <clears throat> 1930s, okay? And I, he remembered one incident where he saved up enough money to buy a pair of roller skates. And uh, my great uncle who brought him over here said, what happens if you hurt yourself? You sprain your ankle and you can't work or this or that. So what he did was he returned the roller skates, you know? And um, so th those are kind of the opportunities, the things that you say, I saved up for and I deserve it, I get it, you know, that. Then you gotta look at how you fit in into the family scheme of things, into society and everything like that, and realize what your responsibilities are. Yeah, that's definitely something that came across in your episode. And if, if you haven't listened to it yet, I really encourage everybody to go to the, um, you can go to the Publix Radio website and Mosaic's right on the side and uh, the Chin family is the latest episode. Yeah, that intergenerational um, feeling of responsibility, but also feeling of like comfortability in the um, in American culture. Um, and I, one other part of the episode that I love, and I tell everybody about it uh, as like a fun fact, is the adaptation of Chinese American food to fit an American palate. Could you talk a little bit about that and kind of like what you told me about chop suey and and the ways in which you had to kind of adapt food to so that people would eat it? Sure. Uh, Chinese food got introduced by um, the gold miners and the uh, railroad workers in the 1800s, okay? And so uh, they would get typically, uh, you know, scraps and leftovers and all that, and they would cook it up and uh, share it with everybody. And when some of the other non-Chinese uh, miners, you know, would eat with them and say, what is this you're cooking or what is this I'm eating? And the phrase they use is 
chop suey, which means chop suey. Okay, it's the same thing, Chinese pronunciation. And the literal translation means all mixed up. Or, you know, it's like a potpourri. Okay, and so uh, that's how chop suey, uh, you know, came to being. Okay, there's, and then when they uh, finally, you know, sort of like, um, um, you know, when they did the restaurants and all that, they said, what should chop suey be? You can't just have uh, different leftovers and just put them together like that. So, uh, you know, the celery, the onions, the bean sprouts and all that, that became chop suey. And they adapted it to, um, you know, the local taste, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, and based upon the fresh ingredients that were available locally, as opposed to what was grown in China. Mm, yeah, I think that's, I think that's really interesting because to me, it seems like a way of surviving, like your economy, your business uh, depends on being able to sell food. And so in order to do that, you have to uh, use all these new ingredients that you're maybe not comfortable using or you're not familiar with, but, but then it becomes something entirely new that people love and it becomes part of this culture. I think that's really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with Chinese food too, you know, they adapted to American taste. So we had things like French fries, pickled beets, coleslaw, you know, in the 1940s and 50s. And that was considered Chinese food. It's really interesting. Also, well, so that kind of brings up, um, you know, you've lived in Providence, or at least in Rhode Island in the Providence area for, for a long time, and you've seen everything change in the past 50 years or so. So how how has the Chinese community changed from when you were growing up in Providence to, to now? Like, where do you see it? Um, where, where are most Chinese people settling? And is it the same sort of immigration that, that uh, waves of immigration that you grew up with? Yes, the first wave of immigrants were really uh, related to the existing uh, uh, people that were here in the United States. They would sponsor their relatives, come over here. They would, uh, you know, get together and, uh, you know, open a laundry or a restaurant, and uh, they would just work, um, you know, day and night, okay, just to be able to save up enough money and maybe bring another relative over and all that, okay. So, uh, you know, in, in that day, uh, in the 50s, you know, 40s, 50s, and 60s, everybody knew each other, you know, so when you go to a, any kind of gathering, you would know like 90% of the people. And then once the 70s get on and more uh, uh, immigrants from China, from different parts, different regions, from Taiwan and all that, uh, you know, then it became, um, you, know, um, you know, more diversified from a, a, a Chinese uh, perspective. But we still uh, managed to, um, you know, once somebody comes over, we help them assimilate by providing them with housing within a uh, Chinese landlords, um, you know, um, schooling, okay. Uh, English as a second language. We got them jobs at the laundry or the restaurant. So uh, in a way we feel an obligation to help the new immigrant who, uh, who's come to a strange country, doesn't speak the language and help them uh, assimilate over a period of time. And that's something that um, didn't make it into the episode but I had this whole part and Charlie knows we had this whole interview at Anliang which is the Chinese Merchants Association that Correct. Charlie's the president of. And just to paint the scene, so An Liang's in Cranston, and um, it's like a, at this point, it's like a, like a hangout spot on a daily basis, but you also do events and you like, like you're saying, support the Chinese community. But there are also these really cool mahjong tables uh, where they shuffle automatically. It's really cool. But anyway, um, so we had this whole long interview there, and that's where um, I got to hear a lot of Charlie's backstory and a lot of other guys were there who were Charlie's same age. Um, so I just, I guess I want to just ask a little bit about An Liang and what's, what's, um, what, what is your explanation of what An Liang is and the importance of supporting other Chinese businesses? Yes, the An Liang Association had its roots, uh, you know, back in the early 1900s, okay. Uh, from uh, you know Taiwan, believe it or not, and so um, what they uh, used to do was form a, it's like a fraternal organization, and they provide the support services for new immigrants as well as um, you know um, uh, merchants who may be looking for business opportunities, setting up a laundry or a restaurant. They would help uh, them with the permitting process, you know, and help them with uh, you know bridge loans, okay, so that they can open help them, uh, you know, with uh, all the regulatory uh, uh, things. It, 
On Young later provided a, a means for the people to come together, celebrate certain holidays together, cook things for everybody, and also help the uh, immigrants that have worked here uh, and uh, were ready to retire. We would help them with transportation, a, a one-way ticket, so to speak, to back to China or Hong Kong where they can retire. Um, they couldn't uh, support themselves with the uh, social security uh, you know, benefits that they get in the US. But when they go back to China and get those uh, two or $300 a month, that translates into um, you know, probably close to a thousand uh, you know, renminbi, which the average person there was making at that time about three or 400. So uh, they would go back to China and earn three, three times more than the local uh, uh, you know, worker there. And so they had a nice retirement and all that. And so most of these people worked until they were you know, close to 70 and all that. And so it was a way of like, um, you know, letting them have their retirement years, you know, back at home where they uh, feel a strong affinity to. And back then there was always relatives there, you know, so it's much less now, okay? You go back there, everybody is gone. There's nobody at the villages and all that. So um, there's no need to um, uh, help them, uh, let's say send money back there to support the village and all that. But, you know, the role was very important during the 50s and 60s and 70s and all that. Mm. Well, um, for, I, I do want to, I have a ton more questions to ask. I'm sure you all do too. I'm not looking at the chat box, um, but is first, before we do that, is, can anyone see if Conroy is here? Yes, I'm here. Oh, Conroy. Okay, cool. Yeah. So let's put a pin in Charlie and let's go into Conroy and then we could have kind of like a longer conversation. We'll bring in Jennifer. Um, and we can answer a lot of questions too that are coming in. Okay, cool. Okay, so this is Conroy. Okay. He's in his food truck right now, right? Yes. Okay, great. So the connection might be a little spotty, but I'm going to play um, a snippet from your episode, your episode, Conroy. And uh, just to set it up, uh, this is from last season, so you might, I don't think you will hear, but it was done with my co-host at the time, co-producer Alex Nunes, who's a fantastic journalist and is currently uh, working, continue to work for the station um, at the South County Bureau. So he's out down in Westerly. But in this episode, talked about Conroy's um, immigration from Jamaica uh, when he's in his 20s, right? You're in your 20s, maybe, yeah, yeah, right? It's like in the, okay, yeah. Um, and you and and but this snippet I'm going to play is about Conroy's childhood in Jamaica and how it had 10 years before he was born, Jamaica won independence uh, from Britain, Great Britain as a British colony. So, um, you know, a lot of people think of Jamaica as like this colorful, warm, vibrant uh, place, but the C Jamaica Conroy experience was very strict and British um, and food was a way to kind of get around that. So here is a quick clip from his episode. And Conroy says his childhood is governed by a British sense of propriety. And you could not sit on the bed um, when it's made. The slippers has to be left outside and you know, it's very, very rigid. For me, it was like anxiousness, internal anxiousness, and just felt uh, subdued, constantly, felt controlled, you know. A little depressing, you know. School is rigid too. Conroy describes it as militant, making students memorize long passages and follow every rule to a T. There's no emotions, there's no fun. Uh, so the kids who uh, were able to, you know, follow that strict rule, nothing was out of the box, were able to read something, recite it back, the other kids were considered smart. Conroy is not one of those kids. He's drawn to art and music. He doesn't do well on tests and he questions his teachers. He's told to be quiet, to turn off whatever curiosity that's bubbling inside of his head. But at the end of each day, there's an escape. Love, exciting and new. I was always been fascinated with food as a kid. Uh, I can't remember the age, but I remember watching Love Boat. I remember this one guy stood up was Isaac the bartender. He was so smiling, you know, very happy. I remember seeing the chefs with the tall hats and it was just fascinating. And then seeing the buffets and the color scheme and just the, the expressions of people integrating and, and, and just talking and having the food being the connector. I was just in awe, you know, and I was like, wow, one day I'd love to work on a ship. That's where I said I wanted to be a chef. 
Okay, I love that that clip for a lot of reasons, but obviously the love boat uh, stands out and Isaac. So it kind of brings me in to the first question I want to ask you, Conroy, is, um, you know, being a kid in Jamaica, how important was it for you to have Black role models, like representation either in your community, like if you listen to the episode, uh, Conroy talks about, about this guy, Crush, who taught him how to make dough at his bakery. Um, and then Isaac, you know, like how often was it that you saw somebody who looked like you on TV and how, how did that change kind of the course of, of what you thought was possible for you? Well, thanks for asking that question. Thanks for uh, putting together this event and thank you for having uh, me here. So uh, <clears throat> before I, you know, answer your question, this is a very emotional topic, you know, uh, and I, really this moment every time I talk about it. Uh, for me, um, it was so important, but I didn't realize how important it was at that time until now, you know, back then I was just filled with curiosity, you know? And, uh, and because um, I couldn't find the, I didn't get the attention that I was seeking with the home. So, um, you know, like you said, in the video, like I said in the video, my child was filled with curiosity. And so because I was not getting the, um, I wasn't connected with my family um, as a child would at the time, you know, it was, you know, I started looking for the connection outside the family. And so when I run to people like Crush who saw curiosity and I saw people like uh, Sir Isaac on the love boat, it was more of the emotional connection that was more important than it was for someone that looks like me personally, you know? But I did, yeah. but then as I got older, I realized how I understand word issue. Then I realized now, wow, how important for someone that looks like me to be in TV. So it was like, a, it was like, so it was like a, a two part expectation, you know? One is more the emotional connection. I think the emotional connection was the first thing for me. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting because I think when you're little, you don't realize the, the, the extent to which uh, you might be different or the same as other people. Like the idea of like race, systemic racism isn't really yep. that prevalent in you know, a 10 year old's brain. You might see some you know, more immediate uh, forms of right. that, but, but you're not really <laughs> cognizant of it. Um, uh, so, for, for me, it was what I experienced um, was more social economics, you know, yeah. back in Jamaica. And uh, maybe a hint of um, racial, because that was left all from the British. That was kind of almost planted in the, into the culture, you know. Mm. And so, as I became, when I came to America, even when I first came here, I didn't understand the language that was used around me, you know, as it, relates, uh, as it relates to systematic racism and so forth. And it wasn't until really, until like really a couple of years ago when I was able to kind of slow down because I was working 80 hours. So that kind of keeps you distracted from the issues because you're trying to catch up, so to, so to speak, socially and economically. And so I didn't really start on paying attention as an immigrant to the race issues and really until a couple of years ago. What changed that for you? I think I saw it more when I became a business owner. You know, I think that I, I was approached, you know, I, I just did the, the language that being used, I find myself saying, wait a minute, what's going on here, you know? And Do that's you have like I, an example of that? Yes, for example, uh, a lot of people would come and, and they wouldn't necessarily assume that I own the business, you know? That was my first uh, inclination, first uh, red flag, you know, and just saw how the, the tone of the questions and the overly politeness of the questions, and uh, it just kind of jumps out at me. I said, wait a minute now, you know, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. that's really um, uh, listening to uh, the conversations and listening to the debates and even the last presidential presidential debates, I started hearing it differently, you know? Yeah, so 
I started, you know, within, within myself, I started asking my own questions and started going, even going back to when I first came here and some of the conversations we we're having and things that were said around me that I was interpreting incorrectly. It was racially related, but I didn't make the connections, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so could you just go through, you know, why did you decide to immigrate to the United States? And then like, how did that become you owning your own business? I know it was a long process of, you know, decades yes. um, in between one and the other, but, but just very briefly, you know, why did you decide? And then what did you do after? And how did that lead to you opening up Job Patty? Sure. So I had, a, I had a burning desire for knowledge. And I knew that there was something more than what was Jamaica was offering me. And I was just so curious. I was hitting walls with my family. I was hitting walls with, at school. I was hitting walls with friends, you know? And so my brother, Trevor, uh, he had uh, been coming back and forth to America on an H-2B visa. And at some point in time, you were... Uh, you're asked to recommend a friend or a relative to join the program. And I said to him, I said, this, might, this might, might, might be my way out, but I was willing to just get off the island. I didn't care where I went, you know? So when I applied and went through the process, I got accepted and I came here, I landed in uh, Cape Cod and my first job was at Falmouth, uh, Cape, uh, 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 Fal a resort called uh, Secret Resort in Falmouth. And I remember I you know, started washing dishes and the job seemed so effortless to me because I was so mesmerized by the culture, the air. Uh, I've never seen so many uh, Caucasian people before, the accents, everything was just hitting me all at once. But it wasn't in a bad way. I was just so happy, you know, being on an airplane for the first time, landing in Boston. It was like a joy, you know, like a kid in a candy shop, you know, and that's where my journey started. And I started a dishwasher and the interesting thing about uh, work on my way up is because I was raised in kind of a British setting where, uh, British setting slash my immediate home where uh, keeping up appearance was more important than really say how you feel. So, you know, I was always smiling and always being uh, polite, making sure I was more polite than I was letting people in to me personally, you know? Yeah. So I did that for pretty much three quarter of my journey here in America, you know, and um, I learned a lot by the people I work with. And then when I, you know, became a GM, go forward, I became a GM at a local restaurant in Warwick. There was another chapter of my life where, you know, I said, you know what, I think I hit this wall. I want to have my own business. I had that burning desire to have my own. Before I came to America, I wanted to be a chef, but I, I didn't attach to that, that I could have owned my own restaurant and being a chef in that restaurant. You know, I wanted to be a chef at some high-end hotel, stuff like that, you know? So going forward, uh, when I decided to, you know, when I hit, when I became a GM and I wanted to uh, then take it one next step further, I was growing myself individually and I wanted to have my own business. And having the burning desire is the first step, but how to get there was the challenge, you know? And I did lots of networking. I fake it till I make it, that kind of approach. And I just never stopped, you know? And then when I met Allison, she's the one that um, she was the she was the, the 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 missing link that I needed to uh to, to take to that next level. Yeah, just for everyone who doesn't know, Allison is the co-owner, co-operator of uh, Job Patty. Is that her That's title? Yeah, yeah, she's great. And she's, yeah, she's working probably with you right now, correct? Yeah, she well, she's actually uh, through the day. She's a uh, a school nurse in East Providence. And so uh, this month, Japati uh, hired a first uh, front of house staff, so. Whoa, congratulations, that's big. Thank you. Thank you. Cool, well, so let's, um, let's open it up a little bit. Let's bring in Jennifer and, and Charlie and I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, so, for, so Jennifer, I just wanna introduce you again and say hi and thank you for coming. And, just anything that kind of strikes you right off the bat from hearing these two different, mm -hmm. yeah, pretty, I mean, they're, you know, you're both small business owners, small restaurant owners mm -hmm. who worked your way up. Um, Jennifer, anything kind of strike you? you yeah. So yeah, I'm Jennifer Nazareno. I teach a class on global dynamics and immigrant entrepreneurship in the U.S. at Brown University. And so what immediately strikes out for me is that Conrad is talking, well, while 
while um, Charles is talking about how immigrant businesses, how they've been able to create a sense of social economic mobility, have you know, created jobs, have really created a sense of home for, for him and his family, right? And then we have Conway that really brings up issues around racism, issues of challenges that I think oftentimes are not talked about when we think about businesses. When we think about immigrant businesses, oftentimes when we hear the word entrepreneurship or self-employment, you don't often hear about immigrants. And so what's really critical here are these untold stories, these histories that are often not told when in business schools or in certain entrepreneurship courses. And so what's great, and I mean, what I'm um, very proud of at being a part of the Nelson Center is that we do that. And so um, what I, what's just struck me immediately is just they come from different angles of thinking about immigrant entrepreneurship. And so really quickly, just to some statistics, even though immigrants make up only 13% of the population here in the United States, they have started, they have owned and operate over 25% of the businesses here in the US. And just in 2019, they've hired over 8 million, they've employed over 8 million people in their businesses. And so when we also, lastly, when we think about entrepreneurship and the mainstream, oftentimes we're thinking about unicorn businesses, but the vast majority of businesses are small. 89% of businesses in the United States um, employ 20 or less individuals. And so those are the businesses we wanna talk about. Those are the businesses that we wanna really hear from hear about their challenges and successes, hear about the histories that brought them here, and also how they've sustained their businesses in Rhode Island, as well as in the United States in general. So those are just some initial thoughts, these untold stories, the different ways that we think about challenges and successes, and then like we need to hear them. We need to hear them more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think that's really, um, I think it's it's great to hear it in that context and to hear how many people are probably in similar situations or have similar stories, but that's not what we hear about in mainstream media. Um, and uh, one thing I do think is interesting is, um, and I didn't get to ask Conroy about this, but I, I'd ask Charlie about like adapting your food to meet American audiences. Um, and Conroy, I know we've talked a little bit about adapting, like adapting Jamaican food and how you're more like, some Jamaican food's really spicy, like crazy spicy, and you're more into like flavorful. But I also know that you also delve into, um, you make an oxtail curry every Sunday. And I think that that's not necessarily like an American, quote unquote, American food, like a typical one. And so I'm wondering how much you, Conroy, adapt your menu to fit an American non-Jamaican palate and if you ever kind of as a business owner like if that's a conscious choice or or not it's a very good question yes that is a conscious choice and uh my approach to I have two, two different approach I have one of more of an education approach and one of the adaptive approach so what I find out with my uh customers they're curious about how, you know, how I grew up and the food I eat. And so they want to eat what I eat. And then you have other folks who, who are not that curious about how I grew up and what I grew up eating, but they want something Caribbean-ish or something flavorful, you know, mm -hmm. more of a humble experience. So what I do is that I, that's where my focus on the flavor comes in. And um, and then with the oxtail and stuff like that, I do a lot of educational pieces. That, for example, I would say things like uh, the oxtail is very uh, very similar to like Osabuka's concept, you know. So uh, you know, I, I I I pair it to something that they can relate to, you know. Because one thing I don't want to do is just to make someone shy away, you know, because they're it's over it, it's too much for them or you know, they feel embarrassed to ask my questions. So I make it very inviting. Yeah. So well, the so menu is split in a way. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry can... Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, Charlie, what are your um, hearing Conroy talk about that educational piece? Do you ever do that with with your business, or do you view yourself in that role? Sure. Uh, we try to introduce, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chinese cooking, uh, and the styles are 
either let's say banquet style where it's you know very elegant and and uh, there's multi courses and all that. And then we have what we call home style cooking that typically, you know, immigrant family would eat on a day by day basis. Okay, comfort food, Chinese comfort food, so to speak. But uh, the evolution of Chinese food in the United States is really interesting because in the mid 1970s, uh, I, uh, at Harvard Square, there was a restaurant called Yen Ching. And that was my first experience uh, tasting other than Cantonese food. There was less gravy. Um, it was, uh, it was spicier. But it was a different method of cooking. And, uh, you know, we uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And so we tried to adapt that to the American palate. Okay? Um, um, the, the other uh, is in Boston Chinatown, where some of the new immigrant uh, chefs were bringing in uh, new cuisine and new cooking styles from Hong Kong, okay, in particular. Uh, in the UN, in New York, um, Sichuan Village, where the government of China sent an entire crew of Sichuan chef, uh, chefs. Uh, the restaurant was right near the UN and I did go to that opening. And so we slowly uh, began to realize that, you know, um, uh, it wasn't just Cantonese food. Uh, um, just like if you came from Texas, it wasn't just barbecue, okay? You have New England food, seafood, chowders and things like that, California uh, food and all that. So it, it broadened our horizon in terms of uh, the, the different Chinese foods. And of course, in the years after 1970, as more immigrants come in from different parts of the region, you would have, um, you know, localized uh, Chinese foods. And so we all try to adapt that. So, for example, General's Chicken and, you know, you know that entire era of that cooking now dominates, you know, the present cuisine, you know. So uh, no more is a chow mein, chop suey, and, and the cooking techniques are different, the restaurant, the uh, design, um, we were one of the first uh, uh, professionally designed restaurants uh, in Rhode Island. We were very fortunate to have somebody like a, a Morris Nathanson, uh, you know, um, Judd Brown, and these hospitality uh, architects and designers really, uh, you know, define the Chinese restaurant of today. So, you know, yeah. it, it's very similar. You know? So, comfort food or banquet or high style food. You know, you know, we do that all the time, you know, for ourselves and for our customers. Yeah, well, I, and, and that's something that I think is interesting is like Jamaica is such a small island compared to China, which is one of the yeah. biggest, you know, so, um, so I could understand that there's like, but there's complexities to both. Um, and something that, oh, I want to, I want to let Jennifer ask a couple more questions and, and um, maybe bring up some things of that, that she's been wondering as well. Yeah, um, so Charles, thank you for, um, and, and, and Conroy for your, your stories. And I just, what you're bringing up and what, so a lot of my students, the, the final project of my students is for them to also interview immigrant entrepreneurs and create podcasts. And one thing I've noticed in, in what, what you're talking about often is this notion of identity, right? And identity through food and mm -hmm. this notion of straddling like your cultures, right? The cultures from home, as well as adapting to the culture of the United States. And I'm just wondering, how was that for you? How challenging was that? Um, do you, what's, how did, and how is food, how has food represented that in some way? Uh, me? Yeah. Uh, Conrad, oh, yes, for example, um, when we were young, okay, uh, after choir rehearsal, we would go down to the downtown Providence restaurants and uh, between one and four, we would do uh, menial kitchen helping work, okay? But it was that opportunity, even though the pay was not good, uh, but if you got two or $3, you were a wealthy kid in the neighborhood, but more importantly, you were taught skills. If you were to help the chef, they won't show you anything in the beginning, but as they got to know you, you're helping them more, they'll show you, okay? And that's how you learn, okay? It's like learning a trade, okay? And so, uh, we kept that with ourselves throughout our entire lives until we felt that uh, it was a time to utilize it, okay? And when we uh, decided to go into the restaurant business, we felt that we had a leg up in terms of uh, both in, uh, training, okay, even though it's informal training, and uh, coupled with our formal education, you know, business and, and marketing and all that, we felt that we um, are able to present you know, a better dining experience. And it has shown over the years and that has been the measure of the success. And don't forget the fact that you're dealing with an immigrant population and they must grow, okay? So from a dishwasher to a kitchen helper, to a cook, 
to an entrepreneur, an owner. Mm-hmm. And so we, you know, at the Only mm-hmm. Association, we help people, we mentor them, we, uh, you know, we taught the um, um, the first uh, Chinese class for uh, serve safe uh, uh, certification for the state of Rhode Island Department of Health. Uh, Dr. Sam Wong from URI taught the course, and you know he speaks uh, the two dialects in English and all that. So we were able to train an entire generation of mm-hmm. restaurant workers with compliance and laws and everything like that. So uh, it you know it really uh, you know if, if you have a sense of community, what you want to do okay is to help all the individuals there so that as a community we all prosper as opposed to just have one or two uh, successful restaurants and everybody else is struggling you know so we're able you know you know we like to think of ourselves as the tide that lifts all the boats and small and um, you know uh, you know when we when we get together there's a sense of community there's a sense of accomplishment and everything like that not just your individual success yeah, yeah. Well, I think I do want to hear a little bit about like, how do you relate to being Chinese? You know, in a Chinese, Chinese American, we get a yep. little bit into the hyphenated American. Yes. Thing that, you know, and the idea of assimilating and being sticking out. And, and then I do want to hear Conroy's response to that, because I, I think it would be um, elucidated. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, we are always going to be hyphenated Americans. OK, that's OK. Uh, you know, in a sense, uh, we're very fatalistic, okay? We accept the fact that uh, we look different, you know, and all that, but we feel that we bring along uh, some cultural uh, pluses that, uh, um, you know, for the tapestry of America, uh, certain Confucian values, our work ethic and everything like that. We never started out to think of ourselves as the model minority, okay? That term never existed. We just did what we, it uh, was supposed to be right. We uh, got our moral compass from our church, our religion, whether you're a Buddhist, a Taoist, or for my case, a Christian. So, you know, uh, in the beginning, we were amazingly, uh, um, you know, thinking about Americans. And you folks are, you know, the new generation of that. When we came here, the, the Gray family from Tom's Great Jewelers, uh, the, the church, Benefton Church with Dr. Wilson, they were very gracious and we weren't accustomed to that. We were actually fearful of that, you know? Uh, and so when we saw that people with that kind of attitude, with that kind of heart, we wanted to adapt and be the same way in our own way. So it, I guess it didn't bother me to be treated like a second class citizen. We just didn't want to be treated as a foreigner. So we knew that there was a glass ceiling. We, we hit the glass ceiling, but that's okay. I mean. If it's, you know, we think, we think intergenerationally, the opportunities that were denied me, okay, my daughters got, okay? They weren't uh, pressured into coming into the family business. They had their options open and all that. During college, and I didn't finish college because I didn't have the money, okay? Northeastern was very expensive. And so I just went for a couple of years and cleaned kitchens and, and, and did all of the, the jobs. And, and you realize, hey, hey, listen, you know, it's not for you. Okay, and your time has not come yet. So when my daughters came out, we made sure that they didn't have to work, you know, uh, part-time jobs. They concentrated on schooling. They got the full college experience and everything like that. And so, um, you know, we felt that that was our responsibility as parents, okay? And, and, you know, and to be accepted is to adapt yourself, okay, to the American culture, you know? So, um, and that's what we can do. Bef- I just, but I know I'm looking at, I, I love what you're saying and I'm looking at the clock and I do want to turn it over to Conroy and get, okay. get his uh, idea. Like, so what Charlie's saying is from his experiences that um, at least for what I'm hearing is, is a lot of, you know, accepting yourself as, as an other and as somebody who is not uh, allowed into certain spaces, but, and then uh, respecting that, accepting it and, and, and being successful in another way. Uh, Conroy, do you do you feel that way? Oh no. Well, um, I just want to say thanks to Charlie for sharing. Um, it was very, um, it was uh, you know, I learned a lot about that part of the world and the culture. So I really appreciate it. I admire that a lot. So yes, yeah, so mm-hmm. I, I do agree with a lot. Uh, what, what Charlie said about uh, you know, 
coming to America, taking advantage of the values and working hard. And, um, and, and I share uh, similar a lot of values, um, uh, the same as well, you know. Uh, for, uh, for me, um, and the role that I took, um, I just uh, stumbled up, uh, upon uh, so many, um, you know, I was I was a lot of barriers, but it was the level of um, ignorance that I had to, you know, work through, you know, uh, and um, you know, but at the same time, in believe, you know, when you set your goals and you, um, you know, and you have the the withal and the drive, you know, you can be very successful, you know. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but um, no, I think you uh, are. I, I do. Yeah. I, I think um, I do want to open it up if people who are still here, we've, we've diminished in numbers, but um, if anybody has any questions for Charlie, Conroy, Jennifer, or me about owning a business, immigrating, identity, podcasting, entrepreneurship, teaching a college course, I don't know, anything on anybody's mind that they want to share or ask I I would like to add something. The one thing that I took away from Charlie's uh, statement is that this, uh, the, 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 the community involvement and that they have that I didn't experience, you know, as someone from the Caribbean community. And that's one of the things that I wanted to do with Japati is to identify, you know, mm -hmm. the Caribbean that are in Rhode Island and kind of somehow come together, not to exclude anyone, but to talk about the Caribbean, you know? And, yeah. um, you know, and I, I love what he said about uh, going to the square and having that chef style. I mean, I went back, I went somewhere when he said that, and it's, you know, it, you know, what a joy that must have been, you know? That is something that I, that I like to, a legacy that I would, to, that I would like to leave here in Rhode Island for folks of the, uh, the Caribbean diaspora, you know? So thanks for sharing that, Charlie, appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Can I just quickly say, like, given these two very um, interesting and diverse stories around immigrant entrepreneurship, I think we really need to really focus or dispel the myth of, myth of model minorities, right? Like, because we model minor there's a model minority myth that that often is touted as like this is the model minority, but then at the same time, by doing that, it then pits other immigrants against each other's and other minorities against each other. Well, they were able to start a business. Why weren't you able to be that successful? And so what we need to come at it is really understanding the dif different resources that different immigrants come with and minorities have, as well as the different citizenship and immigrant, immigrant policies that were taking place when they migrated. So it's, again, it's just hopefully just kind of really thinking about not pitting immigrants against or minorities against each other, but just understanding the different stories and the different resources and different types of capital each of them had when they started their business or not. So just want to put that out there. Yeah, and I think that's really helpful, especially, you know, immigration law changes every day. Conroy said he came here on an H-2B visa. I know the H-1B visa has just been like annihilated by the administration. And um, so there's a lot of complexity um, to everybody's story. And, and yeah, so uh, with that, I know we could all talk. Yeah, um, is that Mariana? Yeah. <laughs> I can say that like I was so excited to to hear Charles uh, story and thinking the same thing as Conroy like you know, I'm, I'm Brazilian and that's one of the biggest struggles like there's not a Brazilian community in Rhode Island that's not like a big Brazilian community most of them are in Massachusetts and that sense of community and support your fellow you know citizen coming over does not exist in my community and you know I, I was married to to an American so I never got to experience that and now coming out and trying to see if I can get bring some of that together and it's like the sad reality of also understanding that not immigration story is the same not immigrant group is the same and even though we might have some similarities we really do not connect um, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, we as Brazilian, one of the biggest issues that I'm trying to raise now is that I'm, as a Brazilian woman, we are actually not even part of the big Latino conversations and we are always excluded because of the language barrier. We don't speak Spanish. 
So anything the Latino communication community in the diaspora of the US is Spanish based. So, and if you talk about, you know, even if you see in business uh, diversity with Latinos, that is never a Brazilian sitting on that talk ever. So I'm starting to just be like, no, if I cannot have a seat at the table, I'm gonna start bringing like a little pull up chair, you know, mm -hmm. my little beach chair and I'm gonna start sitting in these places because this is getting a little bit, you know, I need to find that community. And I mm -hmm. think that a lot of us also feel that way in, in my community. And maybe I just have to be the one to step up and, and, and be that leadership. Um, but I so wish I had like an experience like Charles and it, it, it can be very hard for us building um, business as, as immigrants in the US for sure. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that Mariana. It, um, and I think that's one of the challenges, you know, is immigrant yeah, di diasporic communities and how they form and where they form really has nothing to do with you, you know? So it's, it's hard to find um, that if it's not already there. Um, and so just closing out, um, does anyone have any like burning questions or things that they want to say before we have four minutes? I do. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so uh, some of you know that you know we partnered with the state the last week of March, and we've been running the small business tech support program, and it's really really hard, especially because we've been doing it without any funding, and um, we applied for some CARES Act money and finally got approved. So we have eight weeks to do a whole bunch of stuff, and we want to help. Um, minority businesses, it's really hard to reach out to them. So anyone here who can help us reach more small businesses that need help with their digital transformations, you know, updating their creating, many small businesses don't even have a business plan or a business strategy. So we have all kinds of tools and resources. So any of you here that can help us reach more small businesses, especially in the next eight weeks please um, reach out to me. I'm going to put my email in here. Um, I'm super easy to find. I'm one of the only Toonies in Rhode Island and I'm always at District Hall Venture Cafe. So um, so any feedback you can give us is welcome. Charlie, we're definitely going to hit you up because okay. you already have you know, your Chinese Merchants Association. So, um, so anything like that, that we can help and get some of you to help us help them. Sure. You know, we actually yeah. have some funding to pay the advisors and facilitators of the programs that we have. So um, happy to share that with anyone. Please reach out to me. I'm gonna put Jordan's email here and mine. And Amy is a great connector to us. So um, thank you for telling these stories. They're so important and really appreciate all the time that you took to share your, your authentic stories. I mean, that's we need communities and um, we need the community <laughs> serving you know, community is on every level, right? I loved the way you talked about your group, Charlie, and and how at every stage, even right through retire to retirement, you know, you're a community that supports each other. Um, that was a beautiful takeaway from today. So, yeah, I, I definitely did not do it alone and achieved what I have achieved alone. Okay, so I re realized that, and this is the time. You know, uh, I'm 70 years old. It's a chance to give back, okay, to those that want, you know, to hear about it. Other people do not. They, uh, you know, their stories are, you know, unslotted, you know. So if you tell them stories about the Great Depression and this and that, they don't relate to it, okay. So uh, for those that are interested and can, uh, you know, benefit from this, you know, we're an open book. Cool. Well, I want to thank Jennifer, Conroy, Charlie, Tooney, and Amy for setting this up, and uh, Natalie, who's my community uh, engagement person, which is great. Um, and if you want to check out Mosaic, you can go to thepublicsradio.org slash mosaic, and there you can find all the episodes. You can find Charlie's episode and Conroy's episode and see photos and videos, and you can subscribe to the podcast and be notified when new episodes come out. So um, with that, thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Yeah.